Um, we have got to the last person in this session, and this is uh, John Lidicote, um, from who is um, a Philomancia Research Fellow um, in the um, beautiful law faculty in Cambridge. I have to say it is a really beautiful building. I've been there many times. Um, and he is going to talk to us um, today about some um, new research. So this is a sort of groundbreaking moment for us because we actually have new findings that have not been actually presented elsewhere. And I'm actually very interested in looking um, uh, in hearing about how he uses science-inspired methods. Um, and so take it away, please. John, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to thank everyone for organizing this. Um, yes, I am from uh, the other school, which I was also told is affectionately known as the Cambridge Polytechnic Institute here. <laughs> um, but I'm not here to make jokes, and I am keeping everyone from lunch. So let's just get right along with it. Um, so yes, I'm presenting data from a survey that was completed last week. Um, that's a little bit more complicated, um, but I'll get into that in a moment. And yes, my colleagues haven't even seen it. Um, my research assistant hasn't seen it. I uh, looked at the data Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then on the weekend to try and get it to this state. So um, it is hot off the press, but that means that perhaps we, I haven't had the opportunity to really put as much thought into it as, much, as possible either. Right. So the background is that I'll give um, a brief history of surveys. And the survey I'm talking about is we're looking at European labs, but these surveys have been conducted around the world, and how patents affect the ability for them to provide tests, um, primarily looking at genetic diagnostics. Um, then I'll talk about our studies, uh, the method and key results, and then a little bit of discussion at the end. But note that that's quite preliminary. So here we go. Why conduct um, surveys in this area? So there's lots of patent-related controversies. There's incentives to develop tests, of course, um, but these patents can also affect follow-on research, or as it's been put forward. There's issues about patent access we've heard a lot about that could occur through um, high costs or perhaps um, denial of licensing or the like. There's issues with test quality and turnaround time as well. And of course, in this area, there's been vast numbers of patents reported. Um, and that occurs with both gene patents, as they've been called, and also with methods of diagnosis, which has also been discussed. Um, the history of surveys in this area, um, the first one was conducted by, or published by Merzabell in 2002. I actually think it was, um, the survey was conducted in 1998. It's effectively what we'd call now a pilot study, and it focused on hereditary hemochromatosis. Um, 119 telephone interviews were conducted, and 30 30% of those respondents discontinued or did not develop a test due to the patent a test for hemochromatosis. Following this up, uh, Chow et al. in 2003, which was also conducted with MERS, they wider study. They had 122 survey responses. Yes, it's weird that I say it's wider, but it's only three more respondents. <laughs> There's technical details we probably don't need to go into. 65% um, of those survey respondents um, who were contacted said that they were contacted about potential infringement of a test they were providing, and 25% said that they'd stopped a test. The tests include uh, Fragile X, uh, BRCA, uh, breast cancer and ovarian cancer, Carnarvon disease, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and a number of others. Um, the first survey of this type conducted in Europe was published by Gasset et al. in 2008 in Nature. They had 83 respondents, and they found that six labs, or 7% of their respondents, had stopped a test due to a patent, and three, lab, three labs or 4% reported not developing a service due to a patent. Um, this led the authors to conclude that there's no menace yet in Europe, hence my title. Um, similar results were also obtained in, in Australia, uh, Nick et al. in 2013, and an earlier survey there as well. This was complemented by interviews in the UK, um, Naomi here. Uh, conducted a series of interviews and published those in 2011. Um, she said that there's generally no problem with research and patent access, patient access, as she described earlier on, but probably widespread infringement. And it, a lot of this built on Hoyce et al. paper, finding that methods were quite hard to get around in Europe and certain patents existed over a series of 20 common Mendelian disorders. Um, this led Hawkins to just say that there's perhaps a large divergence between law and practice here in the sense that there's widespread infringement and nobody's paying for it. 
and perhaps that they're being willfully blind in this area, something that was spoken about before as well. I hope I haven't misquoted you at all. <laughs> so returning to why we in these areas, here's my original reasons, but now building on what people said earlier, this idea of the watching brief in this area, changes in US patent law, we've already heard quite a lot about myriad and male, and there's various reasons why the changes in US law may affect here. I won't go into those, they're speculative. Um, but there's also been expiry of key patents. BRCA expired a couple of years ago, hemochromatosis in the mid-2000s, PCR in the mid-2000s. But we also see new patents, uh, FLT3 or FLT3, SCN1A. And then we also see patents on NIPT and long QT syndrome. There was a paper published just last month in Canada saying how there's plenty of, plenty of problems with that. Now I think in this area of personalised medicine, which wasn't really a topic in the Gasset um, survey in 2008, Precision medicine relies on being able to distinguish who is who to give the right medicine to the right person at the right time. Tests underpin personalised medicine. Right, moving on to our study. So our survey built on Gasea et al. in 2008. Um, we have a lot of the authors on that paper in this current research. And Nicole et al. in 2013, who is my former PhD supervisor from Australia. Um, after we drafted the questions, we've received feedback from clinicians, government personnel and academics. And I want to be clear that we're not just focusing on gene patterns, even though that was one of the primary topics in the 2008 survey in Europe. It certainly wasn't for us. We distributed our survey via Qualtrics, highly recommended online survey instrument. Our distribution, what we intended to do here was to use the same method as Gasset et al. used in 2008, a database known as Eurogen test, um, and at the time, when they published, they had 289 labs across Europe. That database has been transferred to a group called Orphanet, a French outfit. And in 2017, they had uh, 1,676 lab entries. In nine years, it's uh, what, multiplied by seven or eight. Quite phenomenal. And initially, we thought, that's great. Oh, we've got so many labs, we'll get a relatively high response rate. We'll get lots of feedback. Um, there's been a few complications. <laughs> um, I'm not going to go into all of them, but effectively it's very possible that Orphanet has overreported by a factor of 100%. So we might actually be looking at about seven or 800 labs across Europe. That would line up with what other um, professional organizations, EMQN, which is an equivalence network for genetic testing in Europe, they say that this is about 650 or at least on their network. Um, so we have a little bit of a problem there. I'll go into those later, but what this means now is we're distributed by the Orphan Network because we only found out after we distributed that they might be over-reporting. I, I shouldn't say I'm not blaming them at all. Um, you know, they're a not-for-profit and they do a very good job. And I think the problem is this when labs um, move or, or um, join with others, they don't necessarily report there's one less lab. Anyway. Um, so we're distributing now also by EMQN, so just keep that in mind. Moving on to the results, I'll first describe the number of respondents. Um, I'll then talk about the, char I'll characterise the respondents using the, um, our questions. I'll then look at patents and molecular genetic testing, so the crux of our results. I'll also look at patents and R&D, where the patents affect R&D for those labs that are also doing R&D. And then I'll report one or two respondents' views on patents. We have many more slides and much more data than I'll present, so feel free to ask questions or if I asked a certain question. So as of Tuesday last week, we had 122 respondents finish the survey. But out of how many, as I said before, I don't know, possibly between seven, 700 and 1,400, um, which would give us a response rate of between 17.4 and 8.7%, 8 much lower than we hoped for. Gasseradol had 83 responses from 289 um, labs. One of the things in all of these surveys, with the exception of Australia, is no one ever tried to say this is the number of labs in the US or this is the number of labs in Europe. They just sort of assume that on Orphanet or on this database they all exist. So th we've got to bear that in mind with these response rate as well. The EMQN distribution that we're now using um, has already given us over 150. Um, so we're looking at maybe between 10 and 20 percent. Um, which also makes it the largest survey of this type conducted. Okay, results. Uh, 
respondents what type of organization is your lab part of. Oh, that's, sorry about that. The um, text doesn't quite come through. The largest organization far and away is the government funded hospitals, um, constituting about one third and closely followed by universities uh, with around uh, 30 and then companies and SMEs, which is quite different to what was picked up in Gas Aerodol in 2008. Um, where are they from? So we're looking at most of our respondents surprisingly actually come from Italy, 23, closely followed by uh, the UK with 16, I think, down the bottom. And then we also have a number of, of German and Spanish respondents as well. Um, these results will increase, of course, and I, what I haven't done is cross-reference some of these results against our later results, so in terms of who's reporting that they were affected by patents. But it's to be done later. Now, looking more specifically at patents and testing, so there's five areas that we, we ask questions on here. The first one is quite a general question about do respondents think they undertake patented tests? Then awareness of any centrally licensed test, uh, royalties royalties or fees to perform a test, and then whether labs have chosen not to perform a test due to a patent, and then questions of whether they've been contacted by the patent holder. So these are all different ways that patents can influence whether labs conduct tests or not, and how patents affect tests. Um, we also ask questions about kits and outsourcing, but we simply don't have time to do that. Everyone wants to eat lunch. Right. So. Uh, to the first question of whether they think they undertake tests on patented, uh, sorry, undertake perform tests on patented genes or genetic diagnosis methods. We roughly see one third responses between yes, no, and I don't know, which is quite surprising because in 2008, far and away, everyone actually thought, uh, more people, over half, actually thought that they didn't perform uh, tests that were patented. So this perhaps shows that the willful blindness element is higher than it was before. Um, I'm not sure too much more how that shows. Um, I'm happy to, or what that shows, I'm happy to talk about that later. Uh, second result, does your laboratory perform a patented test that is centrally licensed? We only received, um, what is it, I think, we had three yeses here and we asked for people to give feedback on that and we had one written response. And they said, well, four tests, HPV genotyping, EGRF, RAS, BRAF, mutations, which are linked to cancer. Um, I'll have to cross-reference where that's from. I'm guessing Belgium, uh, but that is just a guess at this stage. So very few centrally licensed tests, although a lot of people don't know. Um, does your laboratory pay license fees or royalties other than those including, in, other than those included in a purchase price of a commercial kit? Um, so, Far and away, the largest result here is no. Um, we received seven yeses and seven people elaborated on what tests they were. Um, one was to software. Um, one was, uh, two were to next generation sequencing, which I think probably misread the question. Um, and then we actually had, I think the rest were actually to NIPT, which is quite interesting there. Um, and if we compare that with results from 2008, uh, we have a very similar proportion, a little bit lower from 2008. I think they had three people who said that they pay royalties, but they didn't actually ask what test it was for. Has your laboratory chosen not to perform molecular genetic tests due to a patent? Um, here we actually had 18 people say yes, and constituting 15%. The tests, uh, we had 13 people elaborate on what they were. Uh, RAD51C, which is a gene associated with Fanconi anemia and breast and ovarian cancer. Then we had six people report to uh, FLT3, which I'll elaborate on later, and I'd like you to just store that in your brains for now. Uh, three to NIPT, which has been discussed quite a lot. And then one to NBS1, which is prostate susceptibility gene. and and then somebody actually reported or answered it, um, animal gene sequences, um, referring primarily to dogs, which is quite interesting. Um, I'll have to think a little bit more about that later and whether we exclude them, but I think that's interesting in, in itself. Compare it to 2008, um, so a larger proportion said no, they only had 7% say yes, um, and they had six results. There was to BRCA, two people to BRCA, one to Mediterranean fever, 
and uh, some others that you've probably never heard of and I won't elaborate more on for the sake of time, but I'm happy to talk about later. Um, so they had 7% compared to our 15% at this stage. So we actually see an increase. And I'll actually come back to that again later too. Has your laboratory been contacted by a patent holder regarding alleged infringement? Again, here we had 18 people or 15% say yes. This question wasn't asked in 2008. We then asked these people what they'd been contacted about. And they said, oh, we received 12 written responses. Um, oh, sorry, we asked how many tests they'd been contacted about. Far and away it was one, but up to four for two respondents. Um, 12 written respondents, one to RAD 51C, 10 to FLT3, FLT3, uh, one to JAK2 and IVS, and then MLPA, which is a PCR technique. Right, so I've covered the effect of patents on testing, albeit without talking about outsourcing and kit supply. Um, does your laboratory conduct R&D? This is quite interesting. Um, we had 82 said that they conducted R&D. I was a little bit confused by people who said they're not sure if they conducted R&D or not. Um, but I actually know who answered these questions in terms of what's their position in their organisation, so we can cross-reference that later as well. I love this. We compare it to 2008, and it almost looks like we just copied and pasted the results and increased the numbers a little. <laughs> these are very similar proportions. Um, then we asked um, those people who said they conduct R&D, has your laboratory decided not to develop or improve a test? And we actually had six people say yes there, um, but we only received three written responses. Now these responses were to one to Fragile X Syndrome, which actually expired, the patent for it expired in 2012. Um, one reported PCR, which expired in the mid-2000s. And so the only written response we got was to Canaan myelop myelopathy which is a degeneration of the spinal cord in dogs. Um, so and <laughs> that's very similar, again, to the 2008 proportion of people who said uh, patents affecting their research and development, although in 2008 they didn't ask what tests. Um, so moving on to respondents' views of patents. Um, I've been very selective about what questions I've presented here, so I'm, I'm happy to elaborate on that as well relative to other issues, how important are patent-related controversies? And I think for a patent lawyer my, like myself, or an academic patent lawyer, we sometimes get so caught up in how important patents are, or how important we sh think they should be. <laughs> <laughs> by and large, people are saying that they're slightly important, <laughs> followed secondly by not at all important. <laughs> it's a little bit of you're putting me back in my place a little and something to keep in mind, and it certainly puts the, a lot of these responses in perspective and perhaps explains the lower response rate than in 2008. How has the importance of patent-related issues changed for your laboratory in the past five years? Far and away, um, we're looking at about half is the same in the middle there, or uh, about one quarter of results saying, I don't know. Um, I need, need to probably think about it need to think about that to response a little bit more as well. Then one of the things we asked was whether um, people are familiar with the OECD guidelines on licensing of genetic inventions, which is generally seen as the best industry best practice here, which encourages non-exclusive licensing for genetic inventions, amongst other things. And interestingly here, far and away, we're looking at two thirds of respondents say no, and then about a quarter saying yes, I have read them, sorry, yes, I have read them, uh, oh sorry, that should actually say, yes, I have heard of them. It does say that, you probably can't see it because of the uh, blocking of the pixels. Um, and then yes, I have read them, I think was six people. So these industry best guidelines that nations spend a lot of time agreeing on perhaps have had less impact than we would have hoped. But a lot of the, the large proportion of people to respond to this survey were laboratory directors who perhaps don't have that much influence over that types of licensing. Um, but interestingly, we put that question in at the behest of someone in government. OK, contextualization of some of these topics. I'll talk about some key results. I'll talk about FLIT3, which has only been touched on at this conference when somebody said that nobody talks about it. So Sven, here you are. <laughs> um, 
And then NIPT, which I probably won't spend too much time on, largely because it's been covered in a way in better than I ever could. Okay, so we see a much higher proportion of respondents who think they are performing patented tests, 34% compared to 24%. Um, I'm happy to discuss that with people a little bit later. I'm still thinking on wh exactly what that means. Most, <laughs> even though they think they are performing patent tests, most are not paying a license fee or royalty, except in NIPT, but in limited numbers. It's probably lots of infringement. Um, and as Naomi raised before as well, the divergence between law and practice. Um, now, when Naomi said this, um, she raised the idea of actually, in fact, you drafted an exclusion from infringement for uh, medical examinations of genetic sequences. And given the increase in number of firms who have stopped tests now, perhaps it's worth um, re-agitating this issue and discussing it a little bit more, because I don't know of too many people who have discussed it in much detail. Perhaps we can talk about that later. Um, the decision not to provide a test due to a patent has increased from 7 to 15 percent, mainly due to FLIT3. What is a significant effect on access? Um, this question here could also, is this the menace of gene patents? And you don't know how hard it was for me not to put Darth Maul in there. <laughs> um, I don't know, that's something I have to think on as well. As I said, I've only had these for a few days and I haven't even spoken to my colleagues who wrote this survey with me. Um, minimal effects on research. Um, one of the things I'd love to talk about is architecture and pathways, how patent law fits in with other regulatory mechanisms to produce diagnostics. These are the key for personalised medicine. And what are the pathways that we set people on? Um, I know a lot of other people are sort of w working and talking about those and I'd love to talk about those more as well. Where patent law fits in with that, because as we said, people aren't really paying for them at the moment, so what role does patent law play? Right, uh, NIPT, it has been covered. The one thing I would like to add to this um, is, I'm speculating again, is uh, Illumina dipping its toe in the water with some of its infringement, uh, or pursuing some licenses, and if they are successful in their litigation, will we see much more licenses? I've also heard rumours um, of centralised licensing through the UK government. There's currently plans for a stage rollout, as far as I know. Um, so this is a really interesting area in which people probably know more than me. Um, it's also interesting to think that the European Commission, the competition um, group, is actually investigating the practices regarding this patent and licensing as well or these patents and licensing. So I've probably said enough there. FLT3, um, what is FLT3? It's a gene that encodes a kinase for cell communication. It's important on blood cells. It's strongly linked to acute myeloid leukemia, AML. Certain mutations in FLT3 are associated with adverse disease outcomes. In short, what this is, is a risk stratification tool. Um, if you have a certain mutations, you are at risk of mortality. Um, the European patent was granted to Takara Bio Inc., a Japanese organisation and licensed to Invivascribe Technologies. It was filed in 1997. It claims isolated cDNA, gDNA and methods for identifying them. It will expire, as far as I know, I'd have to double check this at the end of this year. It has been found valid and infringed by the German Supreme Court, um, which what hasn't been discussed. Interestingly, there's a side case there in which uh, they sent tests to another jurisdiction and, that, and then got the test back for German citizens. And that wasn't infringing, as far as I know. I don't speak German, and I would love if anyone has a German, an English translation of those cases. Timo? <laughs> right, um, so in the aftermath of Myriad in the US, uh, Gold, Cook, Deegan, and Bubler wrote uh, effectively an op-ed piece, and they described the Supreme Court's decision as a surgical strike or a substantial blow to cowboy business strategies that concentrate on uh, create barriers rather than focus on quality, innovation and price. And they're talking about the provision of bracket testing. There's a question, and I'm just hypothesising here, that perhaps the enforcement of FLIT3 is a cowboy business model. I'm not sure. I think there's another strategy here, perhaps regarding data. I know. Um, Takara and Aviva Scribe are actually working on a treatment that's actually linked to certain, that's personalised to certain mutations. And so there might be something with regards to data going on there. But 
I will finish it there. Um, everyone can get lunch. I'd like to thank all of my colleagues and our funders there as well. And then our uh, survey reviewers, uh, Diane Nicol, Lynn Chitty and Mark Bale. Thank you. Thank you.